Hello, my name is Gordon DeVal and I am the director of the Carleton Office of Research Ethics. Thank you for taking up this presentation, which will focus on research ethics at Carleton, when you need to get prior review and approval, or what we call clearance for a proposed research project, and how to prepare your submission to the Research Ethics Office. This is module one, and I will speak a little bit more about the other modules shortly. But I want first to give a little bit of background about research ethics and, in a very broad way, why prior review of proposed treat research, including human subjects, what we now call human participants, is important. First, at the core of research ethics, like all ethics, are values. That is, those beliefs that we generally, as a society, share about what is important, at least at a broad level. Ethical dilemmas or problems arise when the values we generally hold come into conflict with one another in the particular circumstances we are facing. Because we value different things that are at least to some extent incompatible in a particular situation, it becomes necessary to balance the importance of those values in order to decide what is the right thing to do in those circumstances. In research ethics, of course, we value research in the production of socially useful new knowledge. And I think that is a value which we, or at least most of us, can agree is an important value. However, we also value the safety, protection, and respectful treatment of the human subjects or participants that are sometimes necessary to carry out socially valuable research studies. I will give some examples later on in this talk, but I think we can see that socially valuable research might sometimes pose risks to the people who need to help us with our studies and also that it's important to treat those people respectfully and fairly. That is the fundamental value conflict that we face in considering whether a particular research project carried out in a particular way should be allowed to proceed. Second, the Office of Research Ethics understands the value of socially valuable, methodologically valid, and properly constructed research, and we strive to be not an impediment to that research but rather a facilitator and partner. We respect the expertise of researchers doing studies in their own field and about which they usually know the most. For this reason, we are very welcoming of discussions, consultations, and questions from researchers in the process of developing their research projects and ethics submissions. We are happy to speak to people about what approach might work best and also, of course, about the mechanics of the research submission process and what we will need in order to undertake our review. We are easy to reach by email at ethics at carlton.ca, so please do not hesitate to reach out to us if you are uncertain how to proceed or if you would just like to discuss different possibilities for preparing your study. Here are the four topics that will be covered under the four different modules. This, of course, is the first module, uh, and I've given a bit of an introduction, and we'll talk about the historical context and policies that guide research ethics in Canada. Uh, subsequent modules, we'll talk about, as you can see, what studies uh, need REB review, and of course, what studies will not need REB review because of exemptions or important exceptions. The third, about some important issues to think about in planning your research uh, and about how it will be conducted. And the fourth module will be will give some tips for preparing and submitting your research um, to uh, streamline and expedite the process of getting your uh, approval, uh, of getting your clearance to go ahead and conduct the research. The history of research in the 20th and 21st centuries has included a very great many examples of scandalously abusive and unethical studies carried out with apparent disregard for the safety of human subjects or participants, and which treated participants in a horribly disrespectful and dismissive way. For the purposes of this presentation, I will describe only a few, but remember that these cases represent a very large number of other research scandals and even atrocities perpetrated in research conduct in past. 
These examples are presented to demonstrate the importance of having strong and enforceable ethical guidelines for research involving people, which includes prior review and approval by an experienced and diverse panel, including both experts in the research field and community members drawn from the population at large. In 1932, the US Public Health Service commenced its Tuskegee syphilis study of about 400 Afri African American men uh, in Tuskegee, Alabama and the surrounding area. Although medical science does not believe this today, at the time it was believed that the course and progress of syphilis in African American men was different than that in Caucasian or other men. So this study was undertaken to follow the natural course of syphilis in these African American men to learn about its development, symptoms, etc. Remember that at that time there was no definitive treatment for syphilis and it was only later that an effective treatment was developed. As you likely know, Carleton University has no medical or nursing school, and so does some, but really relatively little, biomedical research. We do, however, have many, many researchers who collect data by interviewing and surveying people to better understand the human phenomena that they are studying. For this reason, the Research Ethics Board is very concerned both about the harms that can come from asking sensitive or emotionally triggering questions particularly from vulnerable individuals, and is concerned also about ensuring that the data collected is stored and protected in a way that safeguards the privacy and confidentiality of individuals' personal information. This is a case that profoundly and painfully underscores the importance of protecting people's personal information, particularly when it is of a sensitive and potentially harmful nature. Back in 2014, a researcher at Carleton undertook a study that included asking students questions about quite sensitive and intimate thoughts and feelings. The study was given REV approval. However, and I'm not quite sure how this happened, but the interview responses were somehow posted publicly to the internet. So when one of the study respondents Googled herself one day, she discovered that her responses were available for anyone to see. You can read on the slide uh, an extract from the message she sent to the REB, and you can understand the profound feelings of violation and pain that she felt. I keep this message in mind to remind me how important it is to ensure that sensitive information about individuals is only collected for valid and valuable research purposes, and that, if collected, is very carefully protected and encrypted to ensure this type of episode is not repeated here. I hope these examples give you a good sense of why we feel it is so important that research at Carleton only be carried out in accordance with strong ethical guidelines when people and their welfare may be harmed. The rules for research ethics in Canada are primarily found in the Tri-Council Policy Statement or TCPS. This is about a 200 page book that sets forth the basic rules for conducted research involving humans and prescribing how research ethics boards, like those at Carleton, should review proposed research for ethical acceptability. The TCPS was developed by the three major federal granting councils, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, or SHRC, the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council, NSERC, and the Canadian Institutes for Health Research, known as CIHR. Together, these councils are the largest public funders of research in Canada, and all Canadian universities, research hospitals, and other research institutions rely on funding from these agencies. The TCPS was originally released in 1998 and then revised and expanded in 2014 to become known as the TCPS-2. 
Some fairly minor revisions were made subsequently, so the current iteration is known as the 2018 TCPS2. I would encourage you to take a look at the TCPS and use it as a reference when or if you are preparing a research study for submission to the Research Ethics Board. The rules and guidelines set forth in the TCPS2 are based on three core principles or values from which the guidelines are derived. Respect for persons, sometimes referred to as autonomy, expresses the value that people should be allowed to make choices for themselves, to determine what is the best course for themselves. Just as we generally want to make our own decisions for and about ourselves, so we wish to allow others to do the same. Respect for persons gives us the requirement of free and informed consent that the participant decides whether he or she will participate in research, and that decision is informed by the relevant information and is free from coercion or undue influence. Respect for persons also expresses the value that people should be allowed to control information about themselves. So it expresses the value of privacy of personal information and the researcher's obligation to protect its confidentiality. Concern for welfare respects the value that we should promote the well-being of others and not do them harm. So researchers must protect the safety of research participants by ensuring that the risks of being in the particular research study are justified by the social value of the findings the research may discover and are minimized to the extent possible. Justice expresses the value that research participants must be treated fairly. The people who have produced the TCPS2 have developed also a core tutorial, which is an online learning platform about the rules and guidelines of the TCPS2. All applicants for REB approval of their research must take and pass this core tutorial to ensure that they have a basic familiarity with the policy and its principles. Once completed, you are able to print out a certificate that proves you have passed the tutorial. This completes Module 1 of Carleton's Research Ethics Overview.